All right, can everybody see the video right now for what I'm sharing? Not yet. No. Let's see, this is the only one that I can't download. So let's see what you'll do. Mm -hmm. oh. Salty, if it's too much, cut it. Okay. Okay. All right. How's this? Can you see? We already got. It's, 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 yes, we can see that. Good? Okay. All right. I'm going to start. Um, is that does that sound good with everyone? Yeah. Okay, Pia, we ready? Sunny, everyone here. Thanks so much. Okay, here we go. Can we all gather real quick, please? Check, mic check, mic check. Mic check, mic check. Mic check, please. Mic check, please. We want to give it a visual call real quick, please. Mic check, please. One mic, one mic. One mic. One mic. One mic, please. One mic, please. One mic, folks. One mic. Before, before New York leaves and before Jersey leaves, run just official call, please. Before we go, first of all, thank you. We know that there was a plan initially to go to uh, the church. That's not going to happen to the conference thing. So we do thank you and we thank them for their uh, uh, opening up their venue. We do thank them, but it probably makes more sense for us to disperse from here. But before we do that, we are going to get a quick report from Dr. Johanna Fernandez. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Mike Chad, are we all here? <clears throat> are we all here? Mike Chad? Mike Chad? Mike Chad? Are we gonna free Mumia? Yeah. Are we gonna free Mumia? Yeah. I need to hear it louder. Are we going to free Mumia? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. All right. That's why we're here, and we've been summoned to return to this courtroom on December sixteenth. One six. December one six. December 16, we returned. What happened in the courtroom? The judge essentially uh, wrote a 31-page decision, but before she issued her decision, she asked the attorneys, both the prosecutors and our attorneys, to make arguments. Essentially, it seems that the new evidence that was discovered in 2019 seems to be dismissed by the judge. Right now, the question that might be salvageable is the issue of Batson, which as you know, is the issue of discrimination in jury selection. So she issued a motion to dismiss, which means that under the law, our attorneys have 20 days to respond and to rebut or challenge her motion to dismiss, which is the position of the prosecution, of the DA's office. And the DA has 10 days to respond. Okay, a lot happened in the courtroom, but what do we see emerging? What we see emerging is that this lower court is taking as fact and truth the evidence and findings of the original prosecutor, the police, and the lower courts. So it's essentially a case, again, of asking the goat to watch the lettuce. Right. Essentially, you have a lower court, a police department, and a prosecution that was corrupt to the core, 
that concocted evidence, manufactured evidence, and hid evidence. And because of the laws of this country, this judge is accepting as fact those findings of the lower court. What do we have to do? Is expose the fact that 35 uh, of the 35 police officers involved in this case, 15 were convicted, charged for manufacturing evidence and essentially fr framing uh, the person jailed. Um, and on and on and on and on. We know that there is a long history in this courtroom, in this courthouse, of uh, essentially dismissing black jurors. We know that. What's the name of the of tapes? The McMahon tapes tell us that. Our assignment is really to teach the citizens of the city, mostly of the city, because the world knows that Mumia is innocent. This city does not, because there is a blackout on this case. We need to teach the people of this city the very basics of this case and, um, and bring more people out here and have people talking about Mumia in their churches, in the schools, in the streets. But once again, just to, uh, uh, just to give you a sense of what's coming up next, December 16th at 9.30 is when the courtroom opens. That's when we are to be here. I think we have to have a lot more black people in the courtroom, inside. We need black people, people of color, those affected by the disaster of um, the hyper incarceration of black people and Latinos. We need you in the courtroom, sending a message to the judge and to the press that we are not going to take this sitting down. And now attorneys for Mumia Abu-Jamal attempted to introduce new evidence in his case today, hoping a judge would ultimately grant their motion for a new trial. Abu-Jamal was convicted more than 40 years ago in the shooting death of Philadelphia police officer Daniel Faulkner. Eyewitness News reporter Matt Petrillo takes us through what happened in court. Supporters of Mamiya Abu Jamal rallied outside the Criminal Justice Center Wednesday ahead of yet another hearing for the now 68 year old convicted cop killer. It's time to bring him home, so um, it's time to give him a new case. Abu Jamal was convicted of shooting and killing Philadelphia police officer Daniel Faulkner in 1981. For decades, multiple appeals to overturn his conviction have failed. Now, his defense team says new evidence from 2018 shows the district attorney's office withheld evidence during trial. Evidence his defense and supporters say suggests a tainted conviction. I, I pray and I believe that we will get justice for me and he will be free. But during Wednesday's hearing, prosecutors argued the defense's attempts to introduce that new evidence had already been heard by other courts. The judge agreed, saying she intends to dismiss but is giving both the defense and prosecution the next several weeks to respond. I think the judge today was very thorough. Faulkner's widow, Maureen, spoke after the hearing. It's been a long journey, and I will not give up. I will continue to come to court. I will keep Mumia Abul Jamal in prison until he is six foot under. And the judge is expected to make a decision on this case in mid December. In Center City, Matt Petrillo, CBS 3 Eyewitness News. What's the call? What's the call? Free them all. What's the call? Free them all. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. We welcome you to another program, another event on behalf of the campaign to free Mumia Abu Jamal and all political prisoners. Welcome to our virtual rally to free Mumia and all PPs, all political prisoners. My name is Brother Gabe Bryant. Welcome to this evening's event. I want to share our colleague and comrade Sophia. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, we're happy to have you. And we hope that this program will be transformational and in many ways, 
uh, a call to action for us as we continue into the new year. We're happy to have you in support of us on this particular day, in support of Mumia, most of all. And we have to always remember, before I throw it back to Gabe, that this day really reminds us of why we continue to fight for 41 years for Mumia. Um, it's also a reminder to those who oppose him that he has immense love and support and solidarity here and abroad. So um, let's continue to lift up Mumia's spirits and that of his family and loved ones as we take on tonight. Anything else, Gabe, before I move on? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we've got people t tapping in this evening from all over the world, not even just all over the country, all over the world who will be speaking today. Um, and really tonight also is about galvanizing supporters from around the country to support not only Mumia Abu-Jamal, but several other very important campaigns that you're going to hear very shortly. Like we always say, we all, not only is it that we all we got, but we all we need. So we got work to do. We got work to do into 2023. And so we're going to get right to it. Um, the next piece that we want to chop right into, it's very important that you, that we understand the legals. So I'm going to pass it back over to you, Sophia. Yes, yes, so very important. So now we will turn to Noel Hanrahan from Prison Radio to give us a special legal update in Mumia's case. Noel. Thank you. You know, as a KPFA radio producer and host, I aired Mumia's voice from Huntington State Prison and Death Row, and I brought his first book out from prison. Now, a few years ago, I was a licensed private investigator in Philadelphia, and I realized during Mumia's health crisis that there simply were not enough lawyers to represent our folks inside, and people were dying. So I went to law school and got a Pennsylvania bar card. Currently, I'm representing Marvin Pete Walker Jr., who has spent the last 43 years on death row in California and had his conviction overturned based on Batson when Santa Clara County improperly removed African-Americans from his jury. He's facing a retrial. But let me begin with a premise that might surprise some of you. The law will never be enough. It's necessary, it's crucial, it's decisive, but it will never be enough. You know, as Dave Carries once said, and Mumia is fond of quoting, law is politics by other means. And we must ask ourselves what we can all do. And let me surprise you possibly by saying that Love is going to be a really key element in Mumia's path home. Like every action that hits on that, that transmits that embodies love matters. We'll need to lift up Mumia's humanity so that his amazing capacity to touch people is illuminated. Like we have to see Mumia for who he really is. Like looking past the man, past the words, past the rhetoric, even the magical baritone. We want to see a kid who was mayor of Philadelphia for a day, who appeared in Shakespeare in Fairmont Park, whose brothers and sisters, Ronnie, Keith, and Lydia, and Bill, and his mother, Edith Cook, and his father, Mr. Bill, love and loved him. As his journalistic star was rising, he's a man loved by his wife, Wadia, whom he has a husband, a father, a grandfather, and now a great-grandfather. But he's also in prison. Mumia was arrested on December 9, 1981, at the age of 26, for the shooting death of Philadelphia police officer Daniel Faulkner. That's the case. He spent 42 years in prison. Mumia, in the early days, thought release was just around the corner. How could they keep him inside when he was innocent, he thought. Now, the last four decades have seen the erosion of habeas corpus and the construction of what I call a devil snare of laws and judicial rulings that prevent prisoners from challenging their convictions. In Pennsylvania, the law governing prisoners' attempts to overturn their convictions is called the post-conviction relief application. Now, in order to get to court after your direct appeals have been denied, you have to find an exception to the statute that hurdles time bars, previously litigated, waived claims, that all seek to limit your petition from being heard. In Mumia's case, his latest PCRA petition is asking the court to grant him an evidentiary hearing in a new trial based on evidence that was suppressed for 38 years. The judge, supervising criminal court judge is Lucretia Clements. She's hearing that case now. On October 26, she issued a tentative ruling denying his petition for a new trial. She offered to consider Mumia's lawyer's briefs asking for reconsideration as set December 16th as the day she will consider 
those briefs and the opposition. Now, Mumia has a fantastic, brilliant legal team. Samuel Spital, who's from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, he clerked for Justice Stevens on the Supreme Court, Judith Ritter from Widener, and Brett Brody from the Abolitionist Law Center. That's his criminal defense team, and they're fantastic. Let's just say, what is the evidence that's on the table? The actual evidence that she's refusing to consider. A suppressed note from Robert Chobert after the trial demanding his money from ADA McGill. Did District Attorney Joseph McGill actually promise Robert Chobert, a key supposed eyewitness, cash for his testimony? Chobert, a convicted felon who was convicted of throwing a Molotov cocktail into a school for pay, was on probation. He was driving a cab without a license. It was suspended. And he alleges that he saw the shooting, even though his cab wasn't there, proven by Polycott photos. Did ADA McGill actually track Cynthia White's open prostitution cases and fix them? Now, McGill, the ADA, also has to answer for whether he was tracking the race of jurors to bar Blacks from serving on the jury. Now, if any of us Googled the Jack McMahon tapes, you'll understand how Ed Rendell's DA's office violated the U.S. Supreme Court rulings barring racial bias in jury selection. That's the evidence that should have been turned over to defense, but instead was suppressed. Every single DA since Ed Rendell presided over Mumia's conviction in 1982. This evidence only came to light in 2019. Why? The evidence was found by Larry Krasner, the progressive DA of Philadelphia. The evidence was buried in six boxes of materials labeled Mumia Abu Jamal in a storage closet, closet number 17, in the basement of the district attorney's office. This huge closet, these guys are pathological pack rats, was full of all types of furniture, baby carriages, and just junk left over from materials of decades of staff turnover. That evidence that was found in the boxes, the defense had never seen, meaning that Every single response to every single discovery request from the defense and the judges, because Leon Tucker asked for this material too, had been sanitized. It had been scrubbed clean. They just forgot to scrub these extra boxes that inadvertently ended up in storage room number 17. Now in her preliminary ruling, Lucretia Clemens initially decided that this jaw dropping evidence didn't even deserve a hearing. The basis of her preliminary ruling is that it was time barred that he had waived his right to even ask these questions because he had failed to raise them before. It was procedural. Now she even goes further. She says that the evidence wasn't material. Even if it proved that McGill offered the witnesses a bribe to lie, that the standard, the level of evidence that it had to reach would have been reasonable probability that if disclosed, the outcome of the proceedings would have been different. And let me ask you if you think this evidence would have changed one juror's mind. It's very likely that this case will stay with Lucretia Clemens. Whether we win in this round or whether we get relief in another round, we will return here. And we have a very specific set of challenges. And one is time. Time is our enemy. Mumia's health is precarious. He suffered a double coronary bypass in March of 21, and you cannot get appropriate cardiac rehab in prison. And his life expectancy is five years. Another challenge, the forces aligned against Mumia, the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 5. The forces that are trying to impede Krasner, the DA, corrupt judiciary, the frivolous King's bench petitions, and fear that the police have sown. We live in Philadelphia, a city that is currently being held hostage by the sons of Frank Rizzo and the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 5. Just like those whose livelihoods depended on slavery were furious and murderous when it was abolished, the police in Philadelphia are facing the same reckoning. Now, Mumia will be free, and it will be because of the amazing forces that are aligned for abolition. The human rights campaign, movement, Let's get free. the Abolitionist Law Center, Amistad Law Project, Straight Ahead, CADB, the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration, 
all of the Mumia support groups are plowing the road to freedom. And it will be because prisoners on the inside have been organizing in Pennsylvania for decades. They created this movement. They're the heart and soul of this movement. And they're the reason why we're going to win. And remember, when the times get the hardest, when the pushback is the greatest, that's the moment when the stranglehold that the right wing has on our city will feel it the most. And it's also when we're the closest to freedom because they're holding on and we're on the verge of winning. We will win. If not today, if not on the 16th, we will win. And Mumia will come home because we're going to embody love and not fear. And because I don't see any of you giving up on our loved ones inside anytime soon. Awesome, awesome. That's so true. We will win. Thank you so much again, Noel Hanrahan, for all that you have done and continue to do in the fight to free Mumia. Now we will um, get to another important part of this program, which is as uh, Noel has been speaking about with the judge. So now we have an important video that highlights the personal background and history of the current judge in Mumia's case, Lucretia Clemens. My, my grandfather was one of eight. His parents were um, Rhoda and Eddie Clemens. Um, they were a prominent family in a small town called Tutwiler, Mississippi. When my grandfather, who was the youngest boy, was about eight years old, his father was murdered um, by members of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and um, it threw his family from being a very prosperous family in the town into um, extreme poverty. Um, they lost their home, they lost all their possessions, and they literally, uh, his older brothers and sisters, had to drop out of school and start picking cotton to survive. Um, the one saving grace my grandfather always told me was a sisterhood of nuns who provided food for the family and uh, took them in when they had nowhere else to go. And it was because of that that my, father, my grandfather converted to Catholicism, and that is the reason that I am Catholic today. I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, which is a, a very Catholic city. <laughs> and um, so for me, um, I grew up in the parish where my father was baptized, where my grandparents were married. Um, and to me, being Catholic and being black um, wasn't unusual. It wasn't until I got uh, left St. Louis and came to the East Coast that I realized that there weren't <laughs> as many black Catholics in other places as there were in St. Louis. And so to me, um, I've always been a member of, a, I grew up in a parish that was a, a gospel parish that had African-American traditions alive and well. As a, as a young girl, I was in the dance ministry, I was a reader, I was um, an altar girl. It, the Catholic faith has always just been central to my life. And so to me, um, being black and Catholic is just authentically who I am. So I hope I bring the perspective first as a, a child of God, also as a wife and a mom of three black sons. Um, one of the most difficult things in the past year, and also in previous years, is explaining to your sons uh, who you've taught to be fair and treat everyone equally, who've learned um, from me the Beatitudes, which, are, uh, which draw, have always drawn me um, to, um, to the Bible and for them to realize that the world does, in many places does not see them as who they are, but simply uh, as what their shell is. And so it is very difficult as a mom to see your children realize that reality. And so part of what I, I believe I, I can bring to the commission is that perspective as a mom who worries about her sons and her husband and her cousins and her brother, but also as a, as a public servant um, who every day tries to do the best that they can to protect the citizens of this city and of the Commonwealth. Christ commands us to love each other as he loves us. And 
I believe that it is never too late to do the right thing. And it is important that people understand um, that uh, we are called to do and see people for the beautiful beings that, that God created. And while people may make mistakes, um, we all have faults, we are all perfect in, in our humanity. And it is that humanity um, that, um, in the words of John, John Lewis, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, calls us to get into good trouble, necessary trouble. Trouble that when you see something wrong, you say something. When you are in a position to stop something wrong, you do it. I think one of the most important uh, things to focus on is, is, is truth and reconciliation. Um, a familiar cry in the street um, during the social justice protests, there, no justice, no peace. And while I know that many people want peace, um, they really want quiet. Quiet is not the same as peace. Peace requires justice and justice requires truth. And therefore, I believe that uh, we start this with some truth and reconciliation, with some understanding of where we have come from, um, the historical implications of that, how it is impacted, and how do we... Yes, indeed. So. In the judge's own words, it's time to act, right? It's time to do what's right. It's time to, you know, with that calling, understand, you know, out of her own spirituality and own sense of right and the own sense of belongingness to do what's right. And we understand what's right, which is to make sure that we can do what's best and what's right for Philadelphia's native son, for our own voice of the voiceless Mumi Abu Jamal. We understand out of the words, out of this one judge, the importance of from that stand on December the 16th, where people will be mobilized from around the country at 13th and Filbert, people will have packed the courtroom. We understand that at that moment of time, there's an importance to make sure that she does what's right in that moment and not look at herself, not look at the people, because all of this is bigger than all of us. And so hopefully Judge Lucretia Clemens will in fact do what's right for all PPs and for our movement next week, Friday, December 16th. With that being said, we want to uh, play another video. And this is one that we've been sharing uh, just this past week. It's a call to action. And we want to thank uh, our dear beloved brother Mumia's grandson, Jamal Jr., who has been speaking not only across the country, but really across the world really waving the banner and waving the flag to say, what can we do now to make sure that Mumia Abu Jamal comes home? What can we do now to make sure that my grandfather, in his words, comes home, right, as family? So let's, let's get to our next video here as a call to action. Incarcerated for 40 years. Mumia Abu Jamal, has been unjustly incarcerated for 40 years. A political prisoner known worldwide for his work as an author and journalist. Incarcerated 40 years because of racist police. Incarcerated 40 years because of racist courts. Mumia, like many of our imprisoned peoples, is a victim of racism. In December 2019, hidden boxes of evidence marked with Mumia's name was discovered in an abandoned storeroom. Evidence that proves that this black scholar was a victim of racist courts. 40 years ago, racist judge Albert Sabo said that he'd help them fry the N-word. Today, after 40 years, Judge Lucretia Clemens can set him free. All my life I've heard, free Mumia, Today is time to do it. Mumia needs you. Join us in this fight. Stand up for Mumia because for 40 years he's been standing up for you. Join the letter writing campaign on lovenotfear.com to let Lucretia know 
that we need her to do the right thing and release Mumia Abu-Jamal from captivity. Free them all. All power to the people. And please help us bring my grandfather home. Yes, yes. And those are the words, Brother Jamal. And uh, I always feel emotional, Sophia, you know, when I hear, you know, him make that call, right? And how important it is in this days and time, you know, we're trying to figure out what we can do as a community. Uh, what we want to do now also is talk about December the 10th, right? Uh, we've got some exciting things happening this weekend and so much things going on. So we have a call to action, right? All day for Mumia. Uh, we're calling on, on all cities, right? You know, if you want to take action, go to our link tree. Um, as you can see on the screen, link tree uh, slash Mumia, uh, Mumia. You can rally, do it in person teaching, film screening, distributing flyers, more building towards Mumia's court hearing on December 16th. Yes, yes, oh. and just go ahead, Sophia. Yes, continue to spread the word about this that's happening. We have more actions taking place um, in other areas, in Detroit, for example, an all day action that's happening in Detroit. We have actions taking place in London. We had an action actually today, earlier in Berlin, Germany. So there has been a lot happening, and there will be more happening this weekend. We have that's the the London event coming up tomorrow. We also have um, in connection another action at the UN tomorrow as well. And, and hopefully, hopefully those flyers will be there in terms of the, uh, there we go, we charge genocide flyers. So we have so much happening and we want everyone to be as involved as possible. We also want it to be a weekend where uh, in a way the world can stop, so to speak to recognize that we won't stop fighting for freedom for our political prisoners. Um, so check those out. Those are the websites and the links to learn more information. If you want to get involved with us, leave us your email on those sites or um, reach out to us and see, tell us what you would like to do in, in the small time that there is. It could be a simple reading passages from Mumia's books. Um, wearing a Mumia t-shirt and taking pictures and just standing in solidarity with fists up. Anything is possible in this time. And as has been said by his grandson, we must free Mumia now. It's time for us to say freed Mumia. And this weekend can begin to put that in reality for us as we head back into court next week, Friday. Again, please join us. We have buses, um, a bus leaving from New York City. If anyone wants to get on that, going to Philadelphia, and we must pack the courtroom and we must pack the courtroom with more people of color. So please continue to spread the word and thank you again. And once again, folks, please follow on social media those pages, right? Love Not Fear, Mobilization for Mumia. There are way more activities happening as well that weren't even featured there just now in that slideshow. But again, shout out to everybody doing the film screening all day events in Detroit. Shout out to what's going on as well in the Bay and out in Oakland next week. Shout out to everybody doing, you know, uh, uh, teachings in New York City. Shout out to folks who are gonna be mobilizing here in Philadelphia tomorrow afternoon from four to six at Macon World's Bookstore. And so there's a lot of great things happening all day, every day. So you can be a part of it. You can also add your link. Again, go to the link tree. If you want to even plan something tonight or tomorrow, just to handle some flyers for the 16th, please do that. And also st stay tapped in with us, y'all. Uh, in the spirit of that, I think it's it's important to show, to showcase uh, just the global reach, right, Sophia? So yeah, let's, yeah. Let's hear that part. Yeah, so as Gabe is saying, we, we continue to have um, uh, continued support around the world for Mumia. And so we have two quick videos to show you all from our comrades in Mexico and our comrades from London. And so let's tune into that and see what they're saying. Greeting hell. Your solidarity message from Mexico was as clear years ago as it is today, free Mumia and all political prisoners now. 
Saludos a todas y todos. Nuestro mensaje de solidaridad desde México fue tan claro hace años como lo es hoy. Libertad para Mumia y todas y todos los presos políticos ahora. Saludamos a la gente en Filadelfia y en todo el mundo que el día de hoy se está movilizando por los presos políticos de todo el mundo. Libertad a Mumia Bullamal. 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 Libertad a Mumia Bullamal y todos los presos políticos del mundo. Estamos con ustedes. Libertad a Mumia y a todos los presos políticos y de conciencia. Porque Mumia es el espejo que da orgullo mirar, porque es lo que se admira y respeta. Lo que los demás somos, aunque sea un poquito, y en momentos excepcionales. Pero es también el espejo que se teme, porque muestra lo que puede ocurrir cuando el ser y el deber se hacen uno. Sin sí, libertad a Mumia, a, a Mumia, a Buyamal. Libertad para Mumia, Buyamal y todos los presos políticos del mundo. Salud y anarquía. Libertad para Mumia y para todos los presos políticos del mundo. Libertad para Mumia y todos los presos políticos del mundo. Libertad a Mumia, Buyamal. En México no dejamos de movernos por la libertad de Mumia, Buyamal y el próximo 11 de diciembre llevaremos a cabo una jornada de solidaridad y movilización exigiendo su libertad. Greetings, greetings friends, my name is Sarah and I'm Grace and we're sending a solidarity message to everyone internationally who's calling for Mumia's freedom. Mumia's incredible skill for narrative is a guide for all of us, a light in the dark when campaigning feels hopeless. He continues to motivate us to fight for what we believe in no matter what. Freedom, freedom now. now. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. It's always good seeing these videos. I, I, I felt like the Mexico video game just brought the whole cultural uh, entertainment for a quick minute. But um, again, solidarity with our comrade Carolina um, out in Mexico and everyone there in what they do. And also our comrade Grace out in the UK for that beautiful uh, video and continuing on the international front, we now have a few important key remarks from uh, Mama Julia Wright on the United Nations Initiative on behalf of Mumia. I like to, before I go to Mama Julia, I always just continue to see her as a bridge, a major bridge in the international fight to free Mumia. So whenever she's with us, it's a great blessing to have you. Mama Julia. Well, okay. Uh, the context is that in October 2021, alongside other civil society representatives, I had been invited to the UN to make a statement on our political prisoners. I had three minutes because there were a hundred other people in the room. Should I speak about Mumia's heart condition or Maroon's terminal illness behind bars? Yes, we in the movement are faced with this type of triage. Finally, 
I knew Mumia would support me if I spent three minutes on Maroon. But the pain afterwards, the pain involved in this triage gave me food for thought. And that is why I set up the Mumia Health Committee so that we could pool all our resources together with the other committees, the other health committees, and evolve united strategy, no more triage, all together. So for two years now, I have been liaising with the working group of experts on peoples of African descent at the UN on behalf of the Mumia Health Committee. Not easy, not easy in a world organization dealing with Ukraine and the climate summits you've heard of. But when Judge Clemens announced her intent to dismiss, I asked a few members of our health committee if they would accompany me to the UN. Uh, Joanna Fernandez, Michael Schiffman, Annette Schiffman, Mark Taylor. The meeting took place last week. It lasted an hour. The working group listened to us attentively. They had a deep knowledge of the case. And without any red tape, without any hesitation, they immediately on the spot decided what they would do and they executed it. This is what they did. The UN Human Rights Council has already, as I speak, filed a friend of the court brief in Mumia's favor, highlighting the systemic racism running through his case. The brief is in the judge's hands. She has probably read it already. There will be a Zoomed press conference by us early next week, further details to be announced as soon as possible. The brief can be a game changer in the court of public opinion because that's where we are. Because it focuses on the elephant in the room, consistent, malignant, and systemic racism and corruption in Mumia's case in total violation of international law ratified by the United States. One of the main takeaways of the brief is there is no time bar where there is evidence of racial bias. So we're I I just think this is so positive that even the judge will feel that world opinion has her back and she can afford to be lenient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mama Julia, as always, uh, tapping in with us from across the waters, um, six hours ahead as well. So thank you, as always, for your commitment. Thank you. And for your dedication, as always, um, to Mumia's freedom and to all of our liberation as we, as we work towards um, those efforts. And I want to also bring in, also in the spirit of uh, hip-hop, but also still solidarity from around the world internationally, um, some more music from Brazil. Let's tap in with those folks, y'all. Peso político, mumia 
chamar mal Afro-americano, jornalista radical Revolucionário na luta contra o racismo Pantera, negra, insurgente, combativo Nos anos 60 denunciava as crueldades A violência dos racistas Covardes lutando ao lado dos empobrecidos Combatendo o Estado e o capitalismo Jornalista, ativista, o pesadelo do Algoz A voz do preto, a voz do sem voz Denunciador da violência da polícia das marcelas geradas pelos de cima Desde a adolescência esteve engajado na luta e resistência Dos de baixo Malcom X foi sua inspiração Na luta insurgente pela revolução Estudante amante dos livros Conhecedor das raízes do racismo Encantado com os Panteras Negras Passou a integrar as suas fileiras Ministro da comunicação no partido Escritor contundente contra o imperialismo Era ameaçado constantemente Pela supremacia branca estadunidense Mesmo sendo perseguido pelo FBI Nunca desistiu de lutar e resistir O sistema teme o poder do povo preto Por isso injetam drogas e armas no Preto, para entorpecer nossa mente revolucionária Vitória para o Estado e a juventude Drogada, encarcerada, massacrada, ignorante Inofensiva para a classe dominante Sobrevivendo atrás das grades 40 anos de tortura no cárcere Resistindo ao inferno prisional Libertem, Mume bucha mal Sobrevivendo atrás das grades 40 anos de tortura no cárcere Resistindo ao inferno prisional, libertei, múmia bucha mal. Hey. Yes, yes, yes. Love that, love that, love that. And as always, man, again, we're tapping in, folks. Shout out to everybody who supported Mumia as well throughout the years. People who have been on the front lines for the past 20, past 25, past 30 years, the dead presence of the world, the Sunny Pattersons of the world, the immortal techniques of the world, and so many more. Hip hop artists have been on the front lines, KRS One, and so many others, public enemies, so many more uh, who have just shared their works on behalf of spreading the word, not only for Mumia, but for all political prisoners. And really, in that spirit, we want to get right to it. A big part of today's and tonight's conversation is making sure that you all understand also that there are so many more political prisoners who are out there that we must work for. We always say this even if Mumia Abu Jamal gets a new trial next Friday on the 16th, and he's freed by the 23rd. We still got work to do to free all political prisoners. It's our duty, it's our commitment, and that's really our ancestral obligation is to make sure that those folks come home. And so in that spirit, we're gonna hear from some uh, very important individuals for the next part of this conversation this evening who will share a bit about these campaigns, a bit about these people and why you can get on board. All right, so we're gonna start off um, with our, our, our dear comrade speaking about somebody who's very dear to all of us who've been, who've been in this work, the work of Leonard Peltier, right? And what he means, right? When it comes to in the American Indian movement, but more importantly, what he's meant for all political prisoners and really the struggle towards liberation. Let's bring up, if we can, y'all, um, Talia Kachamuel. Imanaja, Mashikuna, Nyukashuti, Mitalia, Yarina, Ecuador, Otavalo, Jactamanda, Yupaychani. Hello, everyone. Good night and good evening, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Talia Carol Kachimwell. I'm the executive director of the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee and the communications manager on the When We Fight, We Win team. I'm here today to discuss updates, critical updates on Leonard Peltier. And for folks that aren't aware of the case, Leonard Peltier is now in his 47th year of unjust imprisonment. And at 78 years old, he's currently in lockdown and has been in lockdown for almost six weeks. He recently got a cellmate. He's been having issues with his health, with his seeing, with all of these health issues that are not getting addressed. And this is one story that resonates with so many others, right? We see this injustice time and time again of not getting proper medical care coverage for our in for the for people that are in prison. We see time and time again that justice is not served and that we they do not get the resources that they need to stay alive. 
So for the past couple of months, I've been focusing, focusing on the legislative agenda, and we've been able to make great strides and great waves um, in terms of mobilizing politicians to speak out against this unjust incarceration. And I'm going to put a few links in the chat as I go through some of these critical updates. And I'll start by saying that recently we released a Senate letter that was signed on by seven senators urging and urging President Joe Biden to grant clemency to Leonard Peltier. This was a huge, huge, huge amount of effort and movement that started and happened on the ground and that reverberated up to where the political people gave us a space to hear our voices and actually took action. So this is huge in terms of pushing, pushing on the scale of reaching the president, because at this point with Leonard Peltier's case, all causes have been exhausted. The only way that Leonard Peltier can be free is by way of executive clemency through the president of the United States. So all of the advocacy work that we've been piloting under this new executive leadership has been specifically pinpointing political figures to push the president to make the right choice and to give justice to Leonard Peltier and to have that reverberate across all of these campaigns, right? I always say that this is this is about this is this is a story about more than just one man. Leonard's story is directly related to all of the people that are that are here speaking out, speaking out against this injustice. And as part of our work to bring in that collective liberatory vision of freedom for these political prisoners. So in addition to our Senate letter, we recently launched a native led industry letter with over 200 signatures that was led by indigenous people in the media and Hollywood and then was signed on by other folks in Hollywood, all granting the press all to make sure that the president knows that they want to see their elder free. So in order to keep this traction and momentum up, I've seen I've seen this to be like a really important critical organizing is making sure that you're keeping these waves of people online, social media traction, social media presence. All of these pushes are super, super critical to bring forth the messaging of all of these stories that we hear now. And on November 30th, President Joe Biden spoke before the White House Tribal Nations Summit and failed to bring up Leonard Peltier in his speech. And because of that, we launched a tweet storm that happened directly when the president was speaking to say, we want to hear about Leonard Peltier. We want to know what you are going to do to free our elder. And because of the momentum that we garnered on Twitter and on social media, Politico released an article after saying the man missing from Biden's remarks. And he was referring directly to Leonard Peltier. Here. And that is no short because of all of the community activists, the community organizers, and everyone that hopped on Twitter to speak their mind and let the president know that we want to see our elder free. And Politico's one remark about the White House Tribal Nation Summit speech was that Leonard Peltier was missing. So if there's anything that I can say about the power of social media and social organizing online, it's that we can get things done. In addition, our comrades at Agitarte and Papel Machete, they recently released a multimedia radical imaginary performance about the last day of prison in the United States. This is a beautiful creative performance that's done, that was created by our comrades at Agitarte, a Puerto Rican based cultural institution. And they have so much incredible artwork that has been done about different political prisoners. I just put their piece on Mumia. We collaborated with Pitt, Panther, who's also a political prisoner who did our word of the day artwork for our prison abolition episode. The Agitarte has created artwork for Kevin Rashid, for Leonard Peltier. And I want to speak to the importance of art in social movements and how we can use radical imaginary and artwork to really shift and make these movements function and work. And we can use artwork as protests and continue to leverage the artwork that and the work that our comrades are doing across the globe to bring attention to all of these cases. Um, I'm also linking here some of our artwork from our When We Fight, We Win, the podcast, which we've done episodes on Leonard Peltier. There's artwork for Kevin Rashid Johnson, for Pitt Panther. There's so much artwork that's out there that we can leverage as tools in our social movements and our organizing. And I'm also linking here the artwork that they have available for download. 
And lastly, I wanted to close by saying that there are still ways that you can support. Although we're making great waves in Leonard's case right now, that doesn't mean that this work doesn't stop. And so much of this collective work really does mean bringing in all of these other political prisoners as part of the conversation. Because this isn't one conversation about one person. This is a collective conversation about prison abolition, about justice for our communities. And seeing that justice and seeing it happen in real time and making sure that the voices from the frontline movements are being heard at all levels because that's where this work gets done and what makes it possible. I just um, put in the link for the move on petition that we're pushing for Leonard Peltier. And, and if you could please share that with your networks, if you could please sign on, share all of the above um, and continue to reach out to senators, to your local representatives every single day. You can email the White House, call the White House. You can demand that freedom. And um, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for making space for Leonard's case today and, and free them all. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, free them all. Thank you so much, Talia, for your message. Uh, it's just so inspiring and powerful to hear of the collective energy and work being put in. And that's truly radical, but it's also changing the narrative. And as we continue to be in that collective space, we will win. Um, so thank you again for your great remarks. Now we will go to our next speaker. And our next speaker we will bring on is Kisise Sadiki, the daughter of Pamela Hanna and Georgia State Medical Political Prisoner Kamal Sadiki. Thank you again, Kisise, for being here tonight. Peace, everyone. I always say, what's the call? The call is to free them all. Um, I, I, you know, want to talk because I about I am I am the daughter of Kamal Siddiqui. Um, when when our um, free free Kamal Siddiqui campaign was just an idea um, that was in 2021, um, and I remember meeting with Brother Shep. Um, being the daughter, I think about I think about when you talk about love, love not fear. Because my father was re my father was captured in 2022 from a case from 1971, and when he was captured again, that broke my heart, and I never thought that I would be sitting here at this time in 2022, standing strong with the international campaign to free Kamal Siddiqui, who is my father. Um, the campaign has grown tremendously. Um, we, you know, we are now, we have our research committee, we have our outreach, we have our faith-based committee, we have um, our medical committee, which is so important because just like my father and so many other political prisoners, they are suffering from medical neglect. I get, I get, uh, a messages from my father that he is still he has he has ulcers he's suffering from sarcoidosis and he has hepatitis and even now he still um is not getting the proper well you know he's in augusta state medical prison but he is still not getting the wound care he has also ulcers and i i get messages from him that he is not um that he's he's not getting his medication or whatever he needs and so the ulcers will not heal um it is so important for us to really be for to bring the awareness and to educate people what we're doing now with our campaign we have a um uh letters um which will be on december 28th to talk about to introduce who my father is kamal Siddiqui, because you know my father was imprisoned when i was when i was born i was born into into the struggle um my name kasise means this war and it was during that time where there was a war and my father was a black panther and so you know, I experienced my father going back to prison. And something that I have now, um, I feel in my soul is I know my father's gonna be free. And that's something that I didn't see before. Um, to experience your father 
to experience my father go into prison once and that second time, you know, I couldn't even, I couldn't even visualize him coming home again, but I see it and I know it. And I think it's, again, it is so important that we have to work together collectively for all of our campaigns. Um, Again, our campaign is moving. You know, we just had a we just had our um, research committee. There's a lot of work to be done. You know, there's so much work to be done. And even for myself, I didn't think that I could do this work because, again, just looking at like looking at Mumia's um, grandson. You know, like my father is my father is a is also a grandfather. My father is, he's a father, he's a grandfather. He was committed to his uh, community. You know, he, he worked for the phone company, you know, he was out there and he served the people. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice to be in this space to speak, not just coming from emotion, but really like, again, talking about what we can do. And we do need to take action. We need to take action. Um, again, we have the love, you know, the, the letters um, that's going to be in New York. It's, it's, it's happening in New York. It's going to be in um, Atlanta, um, Boston, and I'm missing one other place. But collectively, we will, I, I'm going to also be there in, in, New, in New York to collectively talk to, talk to people about who Kamal Siddiqui is. Um, you know, I, I did a play um, and I'm still working on it because the, the play has been about my parents. And um, now my focus, I'm going to go back into the play and the focus is going to be on healing because what happens is that they have been, again, they have been in prison um, behind those walls without the, um, with, with, with this medical neglect. And so, you know, now I, I have to go into that strong, um, just strong space to spiritually through my play to to put that out there to heal them. In addition to getting people involved, so that you know we do we we do get them home. Because what happens too is that our political prisoners come home and then they're already sick, you know. And, and unfortunately they come home and sick and, and some of our political prisoners we've lost. And so it is so important for us to do this work, to get our loved ones home. I mean, I cannot wait for the day that I can hold my father again and not hold him in, a, in, in, in some prison, you know, but hold him. I want, I want him to, I want all the political prisoners to, our, our elders, and these are our elders, we want them home. We want them to see the trees, the grass, to, to be able to experience family, to have normalcy, you know? So um, I'm just here to share. Uh, I'm here to share from being the daughter, but also representing our free Kamal, um, international free Kamal campaign. I'm gonna also, Put the link tree, and I'm I'm gonna put um, how people can support again, just to be just to be have that awareness and knowledge and spread the word about who Kamal Siddiqui is. Um, I'm gonna put that in the chat now. And again, you know, we um, back in June we had um, in Atlanta. It was a, a we had wonderful events for for my father and, and other political prisoners. And it, it, was a it was a time for all of us to work collectively. And I was, I mean, I, I hadn't been in Atlanta for a while. I mean, I have gone to Atlanta to go see my, well, in Augusta, to see my father, but to go there and to see the, just the movement of people, the masses of people that know and support Kamal Siddiqui. And that, that, just, that just gave me so much more strength. And now I am here today with that strength. And so I wanna just thank everyone. And, um, you know, I, again, speak from my heart, you know, and, and being able to take the time now to not only, not only 
support him in the way I can, but also to be connected with other PPs to, to be again on the front line too, because this work, we are on the front line and to continue and also to get my children. I have a 20, 24 and 28 year old who love their grandfather. And, you know, so I want them to be able to see him and that's just talk to him on the phone or, or write letters, but to be able to actually hold him again. So I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, and I want to thank everybody. And I know I'm probably missing some things, but I will definitely give people updates and I'll put, I'll put things in the chat to continue. Um, so just ways that everybody can support. And again, I say, what's the call is to free them all. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Kisise, for that amazing remark. So heartwarming. Um, you're so right, right? We need to take action. Yes. You know, um, Gabe, we, we sometimes forget about the soul healing that our political prisoners need, right? And I feel that Kisise just hit on it right there. And I feel that energy inside of this event tonight. So thank you for that great reminder. So now we will move forward with the amazing Mama Nabile Bey, who will speak on behalf of Imam Jamil Alami. Please forgive me if I messed up your name. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Greetings to everyone, and although I am smiling, my heart is very sad when I hear um, people share about their loved ones, and our Philadelphia native son, of which I live in Philadelphia too, and um, I have been involved with supporting Mumia at every step. Um, we especially had a big push. Um, when he needed treatment for, and I had it together, whatever that ailment was that he had. And it turned out that there were a lot of prisoners in the system that were suffering from the same um, ailment and they were overcharging for the medication. So once we kind of put enough pressure on them, um, we did, were, we were able to um, successfully not only get Mumia, but um, the other prisoners, the treatment for the ailment that they were suffering from. Um, I'm speaking about, or I call my part of the program um, education, political education. Um, the person I'm speaking about, the man um, who was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1943, he was named uh, Brown, Mr. Brown, and um, he became known as H. Rap Brown because he's always been a rapper. And um, he still raps, but um, along with me being uh, so somewhat of a rebel and, and loving that kind of a personality that has no fear and that speaks truth to power at all times, um, he's also a member of my community, or I'm a member of his community, actually, because he is an elder, like, like we speak, all the people we're speaking about are elders. This is a serious case of elder abuse. All, all of our brothers and sisters, even though we haven't named any sisters, I'm sure there are other people being, um, abused by medical neglect, by execution, by imprisonment. And um, Imam Jamil, as he's now known, formerly H. Brett Brown, is suffering the same thing. Um, here in Philadelphia, well, first of all, I want to share a little information. Imam Jamil Alamine, formerly known as H. Rat Brown, was sentenced to life without parole in the Georgia prison system. He became involved in the civil human rights movement, primarily in the Southern part of the United States as early as 1962. As a result of his participation, speech making and subsequent election as chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, we also call it SNCC, 
In May 1967, the United States government targeted him. In, in, in its illegal surveillance and entrapment programs, specifically known as COINTELPRO. And it, that program hmm, was initiated by the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. So on April 11th, 1968, the Rat Brown Federal Anti-Riot Act passed as an amendment to a fair housing law. This law against dissent made it illegal to travel from one state to another, write a letter or make a telephone call or speak on the radio or television with the intent to encourage any person to participate in a riot. By 1970, Imam Jamil was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list simply for failing to appear for a trial on fabricated uh, incitement to arson and riot charges. From 1971 until 1976, Imam Jamil was imprisoned in, in the state of New York on charges related to eradicating drug activity. So the government did not want Imam Jamil or anybody else that was concerned about their community to, to help eradicate drugs in the community. So he um, was incarcerated in New York. And then once he was released, he relocated to Atlanta, Georgia and moved with his wife. And um, he began to establish and organize, they say a Muslim community, but his concern was not just about Muslims. His concern was about all community, all of his community. And he wanted to, um, I'm going to talk about some of his main concerns. Uh, he wanted safe, clean, drug and alcohol free communities. Um, he wanted to respect the elders. He wanted to end dehumanization, especially of African descended people. He wanted to fight tyranny and oppression because tyranny and oppression are worse than slaughter. And um, the people who are supporting him now, we kind of made a turn to um, a lot of younger people, college age students are have taken up kind of the mantle because they are more um, familiar and, and expertise, experts in social media and other new forms of outreach, like uh, the sister just talked about um, the importance of social media, the importance of artwork. And so a lot of younger people are involved now in um, supporting Imam Jamil. Um, in 1970, like I said before, the federal federal law um, came into effect, which they called the H. Rep. Brown Riot Act. So, you know, when you see other members of other communities running around the states, all the states travel from one state to another to, to blow up Washington, D.C. or fight in Charlottesville or whatever, whatever, they should be charged with the same law that was based on um, Imam Jamil or H. Rat Brown at that time. Um, the purpose of COINTELPRO was to stop the rise of a black messiah. We, we know that. Um, during the time that there was surveillance against H. Rat Brown, also Imam Jamil, and a lot of the surveillance and the documents, it was 44,000 documents collected by the FBI against uh, Imam Jamil. So he was falsely arrested and falsely charged for killing a deputy. And um, that happened in 2000, March 16th of 2000. However, they held his trial up till after 9-11. So by him being so, so, like a face of Islam, of course, you know, he, he's grouped in with the bad guys. So um, that negatively influenced his case. And, and he was, and even though you, you all talked about, um, the lack of black jurors in Mumia's case, well, Imam Jamil had all black folks and they all voted for him to be guilty within 10 hours. So I guess, um, our communities, the, the, the flavor of the community, you know, has a lot to do with 
what goes down, but what still goes down, no matter what community, is injustice. So um, in Philly, we played a big part in helping um, Imam Jamil be released from the Florence Supermax, where he had been uh, four to seven levels underground with 20, only 23 hours lockdown. Um, and he was, even though he was charged in Georgia, that's his home, his home state, they chose to throw him over to the federal Supermax program only because the Muslims in, that were in prison in Georgia wanted him to be their imam. They, that's how much respect they had for the man. So the government took and put him in the Supermax in Florence, Colorado. So in 2014, um, that happened in 2007, ironically, August 1st, which is known as Black August. We know that our people have suffered some great injustices during August. Don't ask me why. So um, in 2014, the um, community in Philadelphia, politically aware community and the Muslims, we fought very hard to get Imam Jamil because he had myeloma, I think that's the way you say it, and he needed medical treatment. So we got him released, uh, thank God, from Colorado to um, medical care up here in Pennsylvania, up near the Poconos. So he stayed there for a while, and then they decided, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to put you back. Well, actually, he asked to go to a warmer cli climate because that's what he's used to. And what they did was instead of sending him just back to Georgia State Prison, where he so-called belongs, they sent him to the um, Arizona uh, State uh, Federal Prison again. So he's still being held in the wrong place and he's innocent. So we had what I did earlier was I um, posted some, um, Gabe, can I share my screen for briefly? I'm almost finished. Okay. So let's see, where's his, there it is. Um, what, um, what's going on right now? This is the current, uh, newsletter that the, like I said, the younger people who are supporting Imam Jamil, um, have sent out and, and they send it out, like it says quarterly. Um, one thing they're doing is they're trying to, there's a man who confessed to killing these, these people, these um, deputies. So the, of course, the government is trying to suppress that just like in Mumia, Brother Mumia's case, you know, we have evidence. We have evidence that they didn't do these, these things that they're being falsely accused of. So by CNN, the TV station being based in Atlanta, the pressure is on CNN to um, air the um, video of the person that confessed to, to doing the crimes that Imam Jamil was named. So at any rate, if you look in the chat up at the very beginning, I put three links to um, just some information, um, some videos so that... Um, a lot, some of it is very historic and um, actually nobody speaks better for <laughs> Imam Jamil than Imam Jamil. So when you look at those um, videos, you'll, you'll see why they called him Rat Brown and you see why the government hates him so much. So um, this, this uh, what you're seeing now about Big John, this was a man that protected Imam Jamil and then this son of a um, police officer or something, this guy here, um, he he shot and killed this man, Big John. So anyway, that's some of the stuff that's going on. And they they say that Imam Jamil's health health is stable right now. He's had eye surgery, and he also, like I said before, he got treatment for the myeloma. Um, so what I really wanted you all to be able to see, and, and if you have time, co please copy down. These are the actions that are we're working on now. Um, there is a COINTEL full disclosure bill 
HR 2998. There's a coalition that's working on that so that we can get all of the documents that have, have been used against our, our um, heroes. I'm Thank you, Mama Bay. Thank that. you, Mama Bay, okay. so much. Appreciate you okay. sharing. If you could unshare that real quick. So okay. But thanks to right. everybody who's in the chat. And what we want to do is prepare, please, if you can, to uh, if you have any questions or oh. comments for folks, um, you want to be able to do that as well. We want to be able to share some of those questions or comments from the chat on both YouTube and Facebook. So please continue to put the chat, um, your questions and comments. Thanks to everybody who's being live in the chat. Again, put free them all in the chat. Put your fire emojis in the chat. Put your fists in the chat. We want to make sure that you are not only hearing, but also writing down some of these powerful uh, information and putting in all the great information with regards to the Instagram and all the other links. We want to get right to it. Ed Poindexter family. This is a name that you should also know. We're going to hear from Ed Poindexter. This is very, very, very important work. Uh, we're going to hear from Erica Payne, um, better known as Ricky. Um, Erica Payne. Erica is uh, uh, Ed Poindexter's oldest niece, uh, his only sister's daughter, who was with grandma when they opened the door with SWAT to, and came guns drawn to arrest her uncle. Um, she also was raised by Ed Poindexter's mom, uh, Virginia Rivers. So, so with that being said, we want to bring you in, um, Erica, to give us an update about our dear beloved brother, uh, Ed Poindexter, for your mom. Thank you, everybody, for including my uncle in your um, in your event. And unfortunately, I'm reading. I typed it right before we came on so that I wouldn't be jumping around. So um, I was invited, invited to share the impact that this injustice has made on my family. The most important is how it affected his relationship with his family. Um, because of his fear of the police and the threats that were made to my family, we were told not to visit because it made his sentence too hard. And he told my grandma, just wait until he comes home. My uncle has been serving this sentence basically alone because he thought he was protecting us. He's been in there 52 years. I was six, six months old when he was arrested. So I'm 52 years old. Um, mainly, um, I'm sorry. My uncle has been serving basically alone because he thought he was protecting us, mainly his mom, who was directly threatened by the police, who is now deceased. He did his best supporting us by sending my grandma money to send me to special summer programs when I was a child. And I was blessed to uh, attend some really amazing things. He also helped my sister go to basketball camps. My sister and grandma passed away three months apart because of breast cancer. So they will only be able to see this great accomplishment, which I mean, bringing him home from their throne. And that's OK. Um, basically, I have three points to make. My uncle is serving a sentence that did not exist when he was arrested. Um, there was not. Um, there wasn't any. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry. I'm so I took notes and I'm messing it up. Okay. <laughs> um, Ed and Mondo was not sentenced to life without parole because the sentence did not exist. So it's unfair that they are now being held. He is Armando passed away. He is being held without parole, even though that sentence did not exist. Um, he also has met all the conditions for his parole. He got a college education, had an excellent record with no current uh, disciplinary write-ups, published books, taught classes, helped his fellow inmates working on programs to reduce recidivism. There is no justification for denying his parole. And he is also an old sick man in a wheelchair who should be the first person considered for release after serving 52 years behind bars. The prison is overcrowded. And so why does the state not prioritize releasing an elderly prison prisoner who is no danger to society? Um, he was also proved, basically he was proven innocent because, um, but they refused to hear all of that. So hearing um, Brother Mumia, um, where they were talking about Brother Mumia, we also found things that would have proven they're innocent. There has been uh, things destroyed. Um, we did a voice analysis because basically my uncle was convicted of killing a police officer as well. Um, 
I guess a bomb was built and then the bomb blew up in a house and the police were called there by somebody else that they said delivered the bomb. It, my uncle was not there. And they're saying that, um, and so they won't rehear that, even though we had a voice analysis person that proved that the person that they said made the phone call did not make the phone call. And they also um, got rid of evidence and things of that nature. And they just won't hear it. They won't even, the parole board won't even hear him at all. And so that is, and so I'm just here to tell the impact that it has had on my family because he basically, you know, we were a part of Cointel Pro as well. So I like to thank you guys for including him in this, um, listening to everyone else that has suffered from this. It's very emotional for me very, very emotional because, you know, I, I stand with brother Mumia's grandson. What do we do now? Wow. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for being with us tonight and enlightening us about your, your, um, your uncle and just being, um, a strength of source for him and continuing to, you know, support all our political prisoners. So um, next we have some remarks on the Palestinian struggle. Um, you know, Palestinian struggle so closely remember, resembles that of the oppressed struggles here in the, in the state. And one thing, if you listen to as many of Mumia's speeches and conversations, um, he always recognizes the Palestinian struggle and stands in solidarity with with them. So tonight we have Ramzi Haruki, who will speak more on that from Samadun Network. Ramzi. Greetings all. Uh, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, I wanted to start with a quote from um, imprisoned uh, People's Front for the Liberation of Palestine, uh, General Secretary Ahmed Sadat. And his the quote is from Ansar to Attica to, Lan, to Lanamizan. The prison is not only a physical space of confinement, but a site of struggle of the oppressed confronting the oppressor. Whether the name is Mumia, Abu Jamal, Walid Daqqa, or George Ibrahim Abdullah, Political prisoners behind bars can and must be a priority for our movements. Um, I'd like to convey that Sami Dun, Palestinian uh, Prisoner Solidarity Network, calls for the freedom of Mumia, Abu Jamal, and of all prisoners of the various Black Liberation movements, or all, all, all routes of the Black Liberation movement in the U.S. jails. The Palestinian political prisoners locked behind Zionist bars see the U.S. political prisoners as leaders in a struggle as well, and they are targeted by imperialism in the belly of the beast. I wanted to just take this opportunity to talk about the similarities between the uh, political prisoners of uh, the United States, specifically uh, uh, black political prisoners and Palestinian political prisoners and reiterate some of the things that we face and why we stand together and will continue to work together for the freedom of our political prisoners. First is something that was stated in a video. I would like to reiterate that we faced racist cops. We face a racist uh, purported defense force, which is the Zionist occupation forces. We both are profiled, ethnically profiled, have systems of oppression built on these ethnic, prof these ethnic profiles and these racist uh, militarized police forces that target us. We face racist courts, whether here in the United States or the military courts and interior civilian courts of the occupation state. These courts are systematically, or these, these courts are built to be systems of oppression towards the people that they are designed to oppress. These are mock trials that are held there. Our people have no, have, have no chance 
of justice if we do not go above and beyond to try to win justice in these courts. These courts do not serve us with equal levels of justice that they, they are built for the oppressor to enjoy. I'd like to talk about, I'd also like to mention the suppression of evidence that dovetails into this. In the case of Mumi Abu Jamal, in the case of so many others, vital evidence somehow disappears or is suppressed every time it has to do with one of our leaders. This is similar to the occupation state where the Zionist occupation courts withhold evidence and deny that evidence from being seen by Palestinian prisoners, families, or defense. Secret evidence is used to convict us and put us in under, under administration detention policies, which are our ad, administrative detention is often used towards political prisoners to hold them without charge or trial on the basis of secret evidence. There are currently over 480 political prisoners under this kind of administrative detention in Palestine. But what is most important to consider is that what we see in our people's imprisonment is the imprisonment of politically aware and active individuals. The people who are imprisoned in our communities are journalists, scholars, people who are politically aware at a young age, community, community leaders, and people who articulate with justice and truth to power the need for anti-imperialist struggle. These are the people who are in prison, not people who have committed crimes. And also, it is time after time seen that the people in prison are those who tie into the working classes, meaning that our struggle is also one of a class struggle in which imprisonment and the carceral state is used to debilitate, debilitate working class individuals and their communities, drawing of their resources and times because the, the resources and time necessary to fight this, this loaded, uh, stacked, unjust system requires all of the resources that are vital to us, but are in immense plenty to the system. These people are punished, our people, our community are punished for their political involvement. It is their political involvement that brings them into prisons, something that they something that the system wishes us not to engage in, the polit which, uh, political awareness. And lastly, I'd like to touch on the fact that poor health conditions are also used as a form of a sick punishment for our prisoners. Whereas prisoners of every, the prisoners of white collar crimes and corporate prisoners enjoy uh, treatment that is uh, humane by any standards. Prisoners from our communities from the Black Liberation Movement, from the Palestinian prisoner movement back home, their health condition is used as an opportunity to punish them further. They're denied medicine. They are given the wrong medicine, as has been documented many times. Prisoners with cancer have been, have been allowed to deteriorate without being treated. Um, it is not a coincidence that our people are facing poor health conditions in, in jails. It is, it is another opportunity for the system to look at us and say, this is what happens to you. So in closing, the Palestinian prisoner movement and all Palestinians stand with the Amumia Abu Jamal and all prison, all political prisoners, because we are as, as standing in the same struggle, the struggle against imperialism and political imprisonment must end because it is the way in which anti-imperialist struggle is stopped. It is because our people are on the front line of anti-imperialist struggle that they are in prisons. Uh, power to all people, all power to all the people here and to everyone working towards the freedom of Mumi Abu Jamal and of all political prisoners. Um, solidarity from Palestine, from Palestine and Palestinians around the world to you all. Thank you, thank you so much, Free Free Palestine. Um, great, so now we will hear from a longstanding comrade, Paulette, who will speak on behalf of the Veranza Bowers campaign. Paulette. Thank you very much. Um, 
it's a uh, this is a wonderful evening and to hear so many people and uh, families of people that we know, Cassisse's father and have, I visited Ed Poindexter a few years back and uh, have desperately worked for Mumia. And um, I'd like to point you as Veronza would say to the Jericho website. On it, there is a place for prisoners, both national, international, and you can get names and addresses of those prisoners whose family have spoken tonight. Veronza Bowers was arrested in 1973 and has completed 49 years of prison. He was charged with the murder of a park ranger. <clears throat> and after 30 years time, in 2005, he went before the parole board and he was denied. He went again in 2011 and was given a release date. And then the attorney general at that time named uh, Gonzalez stepped in and said that anybody who was charged with the death of a official, a policeman, an FBI agent, a park ranger, would never see freedom under his rule. Well, ben Gonzalez has been gone a long time and no attorney general has taken that piece out of their workload. So Veranza has actually been in jail 11 years past the parole date. Uh, while Veranza has been in prison, he has done time with Leonard Peltier uh in leavenworth and leonard taught him <clears throat> how to run a sweat lodge Baranza's grandmother on his father's side was a native woman from kansas so he has been involved with native issues uh with as a former member of the panther with the uh, panthers inside and also <clears throat> he has dealt with healing uh, he has learned from Matulu the art of healing without um, needles, but to use pressure points and has taught other young men inside how to heal themselves and how to deal with problems that they might have. He has conducts meditation <clears throat> ceremonies with the use of the Japanese Shakahachi flute. Um, and so he has been, uh, when he went to parole the last time, the warden in, in Coleman, Florida, wrote a letter to the parole board saying that Veranza should be released. So I'd like everybody to take a minute or when you're free and go to veranza.org. Uh, there are pictures of him in the sweats uh, with meditation, um, more information about his uh, case. And Veronza called me tonight just before this happened and said, please give his regards to everybody and to let Mumia know that he stands with the millions who were voiceless and now have a voice. And so for all the families that are here, uh, Veranza sends his love and regards and said he would play the flute tomorrow at the uh, sweat lodge for all his brothers and sisters who are political prisoners. Um, he's very concerned for the Palestinians. And when I've traveled abroad has always issued statements saying uh, his solidarity as an anti-imperialist, as a former Black Panther, um, and as a carrier of the Little Red Book. So please go to baranza.org and then go to the Jericho Movement and check out other political prisoners whose family weren't able to speak tonight, but have done incredible amounts of time. And we wish to thank you. And that's it. As they say, what's the call? It's free them all. Thank you, and miigwech. Yes, free them all. Thank you so much, Paulette, for that message. Please give our love to Veranza. And yes, Veranza will also be freed. Really quickly, we have another 
a brief video, video um, from our Berlin comrades from earlier today. They had an event in Berlin, Germany, and they wanted to share what uh, video, audio, my fault, audio that we have from our Berlin comrades. So we will be tuning into that really quickly. Hi everyone, this is Gerda calling in from Berlin in Germany. I just returned from a single year protest which took place tonight. We are a few hours ahead of Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we gathered, uh, despite freezing cold, about 100 people came. And we marched from the city center towards the US Embassy. And there were lots of animals and sports. Lots of nice visuals, which you will see at a later point when we submit the report. We are sending to you. Anyway, people were very keen on supporting Mumia, as well as other prisoners. There was uh, were speeches about an Italian prisoner with a hunger strike against isolation by the name of Alfredo Cospito. There are some Turkish anti-fascists who are uh, in prison in Germany because Germany co uh, cooperates with the Turkish regime. Um, then there were uh, Americans who talked about the body than five prisoners, and obviously loads of pieces on Mumia and Mars and Cross and the death penalty in the US. Um, we took us about two hours to change the city center, and we saw the city started protest, and many leaflets were given out. And um, towards the end, at the US Embassy, the German police tried us from stopping, or uh, said we could turn down our sound system. So not to disturb the U.S. Embassy, which did not happen. We made it very loud and clear that we're here for Omir Abu Jamal, and that is just a great insight to justice that after 41 years he's still in prison. We hope that we can support Omir and your struggle in Philadelphia and in the U.S. And uh, yeah, um, we are very happy to be part of, uh, of this movement and the struggle for justice and freedom for Omir Abu Jamal and for many other people. Greetings from Berlin. Yes, yes, yes. And thank you again for the international solidarity. This has been an amazing, amazing, amazing night. Uh, we hope that you've been inspired and empowered by all the powerful messages that we've heard this evening. You know, again, please do the uh, research and the connection, make connections, make a donation to support the families and the campaigns of Ed Poindexter, of, you know, Leonard Peltier, of Kamal Siddiqui, right? Uh, support our folks with Samadun and the Palestinian Prisoner Network. Please support these folks in the campaigns. Support the uh, support Imam Jamil El Amin, right? You know, it's very, very important that we put, you know, um, uh, uh, our, our resources where they can be utilized best. And it's going to be towards all these campaigns. Again, this is not only just a night for Mumia Abu Jamal. This is a night as well for, as you just heard, Veronza Bowers, right? So please make sure that you're following all those links, websites, put your donations, figure out ways that your organization can contribute in 2023 towards these campaigns to free them all, free them all, free them all. We're going to get right to our next video, y'all, as we hear and talk further about the release. Put the fist up, y'all, for the release of Dr. Mutulu Shakur. Come home, y'all. Welcome back to The Griot with Mark Lamont Hill. Tupac Shakur's stepfather is set to be paroled after spending more than 35 years in prison. He was serving a 60-year sentence. Now, he's set to be freed in December because he's critically ill. Joining me now is Lamoba Bandele. He is an organizer and educator, and one of the key people who's been fighting for the liberation, not just of uh, Mutula Shakur, but for political prisoners all around this country. Uh, Lamoba, it's good to see you, my brother. Talk to me about what's going on. What, what, what's the case here? Well, we're in a good place right now. After 30 plus years of fighting for the freedom of Mutulu Shakur, we have been able to secure a, a victory. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I think I think it was November 10th, the Bureau of Prisons had um, uh, granted Mutulu Shakur parole, finally, after nine times. So this, this 10th 
petition for parole was finally granted. It's bittersweet in that this particular granting of parole is under the, under the reality that he is terminally ill. He is fighting cancer. Um, the Bureau of Prisons' uh, own health professionals have said that he has a little under six months left to live. Um, we wow. knew that in fighting this last role, this this last wave of, of, of fights. But at this point, we really wanted to make sure at the very least he had the ability to die at home with dignity, with his family, and no longer in that cage. Had he not been ill, do you think he would have been paroled? You know, that's hard to say. Um, quite honestly, you know, based on the words of the own parole board, uh, parole commissioner's uh, statements, they said that probably not, that he really was um, allowed to be freed based on the testimony of the health department in the Bureau of Prisons saying that he is not um, a danger. He is physically impossible, um, Im improbable of, 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 of recidivating because of his physical condition. And it was because of mm. that particular testimony that they allowed him to be granted parole. So what's the point of parole? I mean, if right. you're eligible for parole, right, right, then, yes. and you don't get it, they have to have a reason. Now, if they say, well, he's been uh, disruptive in the prison, he's He's harmed somebody in the prison. He tried to escape. These are things that at least we could wrap our minds around. Right. What was the reason? First of all, why did they not let him out? Well, which time? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, right. Remember, How about that? <laughs> right. There have been there have been nine nine petitions uh, for for release and understanding that you know he was sentenced to sixty years. Um, after thirty years, he's eligible for parole. Matulu, very much like some of the other political prisoners, have all been uh, uh, have all fit the criteria for parole. But what we know is that not only the federal government, but state governments continue to use parole as a form of punishment, continue to deny people based on the nature of the crime, continue to deny people on very arbitrary reasons saying that they are likely to recidivate. They're likely to commit violent crimes again. But see, that's what I don't get. That, that, but help me understand this, because this is my, one, of my, one of my most frustrating things. Um, and I've been part of this fight too. You know, right. They'll say, you did X crime and you're eligible for parole at this time. Then when you go up for parole, they say, well, you're not eligible for parole or you're not gonna get parole because the crime was so bad. The crime can't change. So what's never... the point of giving me parole? Right, what's the point of giving me parole if, if, if you're always gonna say the crime I did was too bad to get parole, then you're really not giving me parole. And once again, these are the shenanigans that we're working through. These are the ways in which the state is trying to quell the momentum and trying to destroy our possibility. But we understand that we have a radical imagination to free all political prisoners. How many of us heard the messages from other folks saying that Matul Shakur would never be free and now he is free due to the dedication, the work, the calls, the petitions, the organizing, the mobilizing, strategizing, the meetings, the marches, the legal meetings, the behind the scenes conversations. That's what leads to our folks coming home, including Sundiata Akoli, including Robert King, including Jalil Mutakim, including so many, Herman Bell, home, 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 duty of dedication, y'all. Uh, next up, we wanna bring up somebody who's so powerful as well, just to get the energy flowing. This brother is the son of a very well-known revolutionary and activist, but more importantly, he's also the poet laureate coming out of San Francisco and a brother who is not only an artist, but also an activist, a poet, and somebody who we love dearly, not only for his word, but for his work. Please, family, give it up for our brother Tongo. Um, apologies. I had to. Uh, I had to get in motion, but I'm about to uh, pull over right now. Uh, you know, I already can't, can't do anything but echo. Um, you know what's been uh, what's been said by everyone, um, and, and just the the urgency. Um, that, that we we all have to uh, that we all have to feel man right now to get everybody home but let me do what I do best <laughs> so uh, you know I go to the railroad tracks and follow them to the station of my enemies 
A cobalt tooth man pitches pennies at my mugshot negative. All over the United States, there are toddlers in the rock. I see why everyone out here got in the big cosmic basket and why blood agreements mean a lot and why I get shot back at. I understand the psycho spiritual refusal to write white history or take the glass freeway. White skin tattooed on my right forearm, ricochet sewage near where I collapsed into a rat infested manhood. My new existence is living graffiti in the kitchen with a lot of gun cylinders to hack up house of God in part. No cops in part. My body brings down to Christmas. The new bullets pray over blankets made from the old bullets. Pray over the 28th hour's next beauty mark. Extrajudicial Confederate statue restoration. The waistband before the next protest poster. Hey, by the way, time is not an illusion, your honor. I will save your desk for last. You're a witty, your honor. You're moving money again, your honor. It's only raining one thing. Nine white cops and prison guard shadows reminded me of spoiled milk floating on the oil spill. A neighborhood of making a lot of fuss over his demise. A new leg for a Black Panther party. Malcolm X's ballroom jacket slung over my son's shoulder. The figment of village. A new noose to a new white preacher. All in an abstract painting of a president. Bought slavery some time, didn't it? The tantric screeches of military boats and election Tuesday cars. A cold-blooded study in leg irons. Proof that some white people have actually found the nooses. The sundown couples made their vows of love over opaque peach plastic and bold accent audiences. The mega ever second is definitely my favorite law of science. Final news clippings and primitive Methodists, my arm chains imperialisms. Simple policing versus structural frenzies. Elementary school script versus even wider white spectrums. Artless bleeding in the challenge of watching civilians think. A terrible rituals they have around the corner. They let their elders beg for public mercy. I'm going to go ahead and sharpen these kids' heads in the L's myself and see how much gravy spills out of family crest. Modern fans of war well, with their T-shirt poems and T-shirt guilt and me having on the cheapest pair of shoes on the bus. I had no choice but to read the city walls for signs of my life. These little societies, they wander together like hopeful drops of a virus. Citizen testaments bent on offering me a nation of breadwinners to hold me back. Like it's a brinks. I wrinkle the concrete sometimes like flesh. My Martin Luther King permanence turned away from a podium into the reeds like God is the dangerous twin. Black August to the mountaintop balcony on my bedroom floor. You know, they steal you from the earth itself and suspend you and your broken neck from their foolish euphoria. From the loyalty of their great superstition, loyalty of their agrarian reform. I return to my mother completely disrespected for peeling the heat off of purgatory. They kill poets like me. Walk me away from my poems never to be heard from again. In this final industrial complex, a bloodline's picked over, picked through a sports spiritual death of your devil at least half made. Police become a pretty word. I'm reading a lynch mob suit strings like they were tea leaves, teaching you how to write about cities. It's the 25th century in the mirror, people. Tyranny against your chump change, your chump to be mocked even with a gun in your car. A cubit of needlework spelled tune for the proletariat, the relapse ministry. Talented people curled up in a fetal position next to a diamond. Dying, just another service day in the theatrics of tea house fascism, in a bouquet of surveillance cameras, in the poverty of God. New blue eyes. Corpses of water, a newly potted presidency, a one big shiny coin if you ask an animated capitalism, another non-literal voice killing his white freedom, the deification of hyphens, medicine bread and picture shows, great protesters in LA, guests of our ink, drop kicking rose in the graveyard, DC mink like a stone torn in half, the pen advances, despite CIA guideposts, despite non-African past and futures, a metaphorical but not surreal day in a horn-written life, horn player improvising king. Like a radio prize fight featuring Shango himself, a real hand sweeps the land of racism. May I return to the ground? May I make progress with the gun on our mother of manual they put on music that evening? A swinging type body language for you to drink with fermented $5 bills for your body language, some applause. My past stomach lining, neither a good thing nor a bad thing, like being psychic on the way to a lethal injection. It'll sit you down with Lady Day. Lady Day leading you to surrender their souls to Africa too soon. Polly thought floating in the cup of water, she saved me, accessing my stomach. Accessing the love of the American lynched. Coat sleeves, wooden avalanche into the wrist. Our mother Emmanuel, avalanche into the sharp keys. Pain. That deal you make with pain. Piano makes sense for them. Laying hands on the world gradually. Addressing the bending necks on the streets of the north. Child insanely in pain, repeating pain in the north. Ten trigger fingers on that piano formerly would have me. Putting a hundred fights on every direction. Over the lady day, leaning on trees again. Recruiting the countryside itself. Say, uh, lay your plan on this lightning. Make your poems a corner pocket of men. I greeted the blues itself. America may clean my dead body, but will never include me. There goes the poet. Killing without killing. Never mind this little painting of your language. May I be a meaningful lynching. A crow's passing. Good and dead by the afternoon.
I must love y'all. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Brother Tongo, once again, family, if you want to check in with our brother, you know, go to uh, Tongo Eisen Martin. But Brother Tongo, to the family, check in with him on Instagram. Look for him as well on the internet. Again, Poet Laureate coming out of San Francisco. So beautiful and so powerful. Thank you for that good word, Brother Tongo. Thank you so much. Now we want to bring in, we want to bring right on in uh, two folks who, you know, are giants, are mentors, are leaders in our movement, who we uh, love for their work. We want to bring in former political prisoner, um, co-founder with Jericho, uh, you know, who just came home himself, uh, Jalil Mutakim. And then we also want to bring in somebody who, <laughs> you know, for the better part of the last two years, we've been rumbling. And uh, he is the national uh, chairperson for Jericho, uh, the good brother, Jahad abdul Mumin, who also did his time as political prison as well for his work. Please, let's bring on uh, Jahad and Jaleel family. Thank you, everyone. How do you want us to proceed, Brother Gabe? Yes, sir. We're just going to do this, man. As to all that we've heard tonight, um, I really just want to ask this question to you both. Um, thinking about these conversations, you know, what do you see next that has to happen for those who are watching, those who are listening on Facebook Live and on YouTube? What message would you give to those folks, right? Our siblings, our brothers and sisters, our organizers and activists, what needs to happen in 2023 in order to make sure that we can make sure that we can push forward with all these campaigns from, again, Baranza Bowers on to Mumia Abu Jamal and everybody in between? What say you? What say us? Comrade Jalil, do you want to go first or how do you want to proceed? First, let me give my greetings. Assalamu alaikum, peace, pass, of Burgundy, John Bo, Afyadea, Efe Arin, Guten Tag, Shalom. Uh, whatever your language is, whatever your native language is, I speak to you in, in peace and solidarity. Uh, and inshallah, um, um, comrade uh, Jihad, um, I think that you will be most appropriate to uh, lead this off, to, uh, to put it at the foundation uh, as the national chairman of uh, Jericho. I'm going to Thank you. you. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah. Uh, thank you. Um, well, just in responding to that very, very important question to round up and summarize, uh, I think that <clears throat> what has to be done, it's been said, that this is the, the analogy here, is everyone has said so much and are doing so much. So I'm looking at, just like you are looking at uh, the uh, the 14 or 15 faces or so, and Gabe has, uh, Brother Gabe has done a remarkable job of, of flowing, keeping it flowing with it. So what 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 we're looking at now is the mechanics of everything. Just like when it comes down to freeing any political prison, you have different levels and different strategies, you know, and so and so at the tip there has to be uh, 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 a profound strategy at that tip of the spear to get what actually gets a sister or a brother out of prison, what actually gets them out. You know, and and when you start, when you ask yourself that question for any support committee that uh, that's represented on this call, uh, you realize that you know it requires some critical thinking, it requires some patience. Uh, um, so the different levels is you know, educational programs and, and educating uh, sisters and brothers across the United States, just like the sister said um, about the the trial, uh, Nabila said about. Uh, Imam Jamil Alameen's trial is all black folks up there. So we got a lot of work to do. And this is a, a, a testament pretty much of society right now. And so um, we have to really be critical in our thinking. So when we do community education protests and rallies, that's to generate, uh, for lack of a better word, I don't want to sound like a politician, to generate the base. So don't throw nothing at me. But generate uh, excitement amongst the people, educate the people, and through that whole process of free Mumia, uh, free Leonard, that, that those demonstrations, even though it may only be 10 or 15 people or maybe 100 people on the street, you know, hopefully that, that resonates where we can uh, educate and enlighten people to another level of, of uh, involvement and so forth and so on. Because to show you how important that is, imagine us not doing that. Then it would really, we really ghost ourselves out. So regardless how small 
our efforts may seem sometime, they're crucially important, you know, that consistency, establishing a track record um, uh, amongst the people in the community, that visibility is very important. The next level is to have a focus groups. So a lot of comrades now have focus groups. We have focus groups that brought home on Sundiata Coley, that brought home Maroon, Maroon Schultz, Comrade Maroon. You know, we have one for uh, 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 Sissy's dad, uh, Brother Kamal. And we and we have, there's one for Matulu that and Brother Lumumba was just on there that did admirable work in bringing it home. So while we out there uh, rallying the people around that, there has to be, you know, we only have so many arrows in our sheep, you know, and we have to take that target, I'm telling you. And that has to be a very strategical shot. You know, so when it comes to calling a governor, calling a pro board, writing those strategical letters, as the sister said, uh, in reference to uh, Leonard, you know, who do they go to? Here they're talking. This is where we're at right now. Because to say we demand, which that's as good to, 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 to feel that, but really we're asking you. We're asking you. We say demand amongst ourselves. You feel that, but we're really asking you. You know, and we're strategically asking you, but the stronger we get, then that ask can be a demand. But right now, strategically asking, strategically writing letters, and this is not a punk out, this the struggle. We don't control the ebb and flow of the struggle. We don't control how that pendulum swings. We just want to be poised and ready, to, as uh, as Bobby Seal once said, to seal, seize the time by our, by our sustainability, by our endurance, you know, by our consistent efforts. So when it comes just right, then we might be able to seize. Uh, we might make do a quantum leap, Gabe. We might do a quantum leap because of conditions, you know. Where all them people were before George Floyd got killed? You see what I'm saying? It took a condition to happen. And we don't know what would be next to make that happen for us to, to be ready, but we have to be poised and ready to our consistent work. In the meantime, we got to make sure that comrades don't pass away. And I will say this, and this, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Because if you don't, then you, you might, what I'm getting to say may sound insensitive. But our comrades in prison are soldiers. Don't you ever let our enemy think for one second that we're taking a war with me position. Do not let history record us crying a daggone tear at all. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't let, we don't, and if that happens, then that means that we ourselves don't understand the enemy. We ourselves don't understand how imperialism has undermined and derailed countries around the world. We ourselves don't understand what colonialism is, what racism is, what police violence is. We know the deal. Some of us are in there for actually fighting. Believe it or not, believe it or not. And most of us are in there for being set up. I got it. But remember who we are and who we are fighting. This government is responsible for the oppression and undermine that the CIA has done 6,000 covert operations around the world since World War II to destabilize governments. They are a superpower doing this. And here we are, 15 people on the call trying to free our comrades, and we are freeing them. But you heard what Lumumba said. If it wasn't for our comrade dying, he probably would not have been really. You have to hear this, sisters and brothers. But if, and if ever, if ever a comrade dies in prison, this is our response. We have become stronger. In death, we become, look at any history book that you want to read. And you'll see all those warriors that have been dead on the, died on the battlefield. And we feel how? We feel proud of them. We feel proud and we get inspiration. Allah is in control. God is in control of our death. You may drop dead tomorrow, get hit by a bus, or you may languish in the prison. But it's how I just finished writing Matulu. I said, whatever, brother, I told him the same thing. We love you to death. Your legacy will outlive anything that your oppressor's life would ever even amount to. Your legacy will outlive any of the oppressors amongst the people. Oh, yes, it will. So I'm speaking now a number of things, and I turn it over to 
uh, Comrade Jalil, we're looking at our own attitude towards this, our sustainability. You know, uh, Jericho participates and supports the, the uh, involvement in all of the uh, focus groups. All of the prisons don't have this, though. All of the political prisons don't have this. And if they do, it comes and then it goes like that because sustainability is a big deal. You know, how are we going to leverage ourselves? So the mechanics, and Jalil may speak a little bit about this, you know, is, is we have to develop a mechanism, sisters and brothers. We have to develop a mechanism amongst ourselves to be able to share accurate information, resources, effective con communication, so that we will have each other. It can't be just a word. We have to figure that out. How many, how many meetings and Zooms have you been to and you see it's listed in the chat, but you never actually called that number? Our 24 seven life of just trying to survive prevents us from doing that. Just our ability to just do, do we're doing, so many of us are doing so many different things. So that you can, that we have to have a mechanism to do that. And Jalen may talk more about what that mechanism is in terms of a people's Senate as a result of the 2021 International Tribunal that found the United States guilty of genocide of black and brown people. Now we have a mechanism in the mix that all is asking is that we become part of that. And when we become part of that, we can elect our own representative that will do that job of what Gabe has been talking about. How do we stay in contact with one another? Because alone, we won't be able to do it. I don't care what you say. How many of you call consistency? You may not do it. But if you have a, you know, the mechanism is what's happening. You can have the dumbest guard in the world, the dumbest correctional officer in the world, but you can't escape because of the mechanism. You're going to walk down that hallway every two hours, turn the key, make sure you're not out. He doesn't even know how to spell your last name if it's Jones. He's dumb as a brick, but because a mechanism is established, that system works to keep us oppressed. So we're talking about mechanisms that's going, to for, that's going to sustain us and cause us to develop. And we haven't found that mechanism yet. And hopefully we will by working together indeed. And hopefully that mechanism, amongst other things, will be this people Senate, you know, that we've been building and that we're asking you to become a part of. You know, and I want to give a, a, a salute to, to uh, the comrades, brothers and sisters in Germany, and for Brother Ramsey for expressions of solidarity with the Palestinian sisters and brothers, because we have to build the same network that we're talking about building people Senate in the United States. We have to be talking about building internationally too, just like NATO and all these other un European Union and all that stuff. We have to have the same type of uh, network amongst the peoples and movements that's viable, that's vibrant, that's strong, that's resilient, because we're going to need each other more and more as time passes. So with that, I appreciate you allowing me to, uh, to go off the hinges a little bit. I love it. I love you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my beloved comrade, uh, Jalil Mukta King. All power to the people. Assalamu alaikum. You are mute, a mute brother. You are mute brother. I said peace, everyone. And I asked the question, how do you follow that? Now you put me, put me behind the eight ball, <laughs> behind my comrade right there. He didn't blow up the spot. Well, I'm, one thing I want to say in, in, in alliance to what he has said is what uh, Stuart P. Carman, uh, uh, um, uh, Torre, uh told us, right? One thing he told us, he said, organize, organize, organize. That's our goal. That's our objective. We got to get organized. Uh, 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 Jihad just made mention, he, said, he called it a mechanism, but it is actually a system. It is a mechanism as it operates. It is a system. And it's a system of oppression. That's what it is. It is the mechanism is a system of oppression. It's a mechanism to, to, to contain and control black, brown, indigenous people, right? Under a system of what? White supremacy. I keep that understood, right? And in as much as it's a system of white supremacy, we also understand that some of our own people have what? Assimilated. Look at that word, assimilated, right? Judge, what her name, Lucretia? She's assimilationist, right? She's assimilated into the system, right? Uh, 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 Latricia James, when I had an opportunity to be released from prison, right, and she appealed that release. Uh, Hapus Corpus, the judge said, yes, you can be released until they figure out how to go to manage COVID, right, in the prison system, right? Latricia James 
appealed that, resulting in my staying in prison and getting COVID. Right? She's a simulationist. Under the guise of being a progressive. Under the, 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 the wall of being a progressive. Right? Simulationist. And so for us, in terms of our struggle, we have to be able to organize on every level we possibly can. I love the idea that seven senators was persuaded to ask Biden to give clemency to Leonard. That's organizing. You, you see what I'm saying? That's the depth of the organizing. We can go to your representatives, right? Also, organizing is based upon what you do in the community, the demonstrations and the protests that uh, Jihad made, made mention, right? How do you reach the masses? He said, we got, what, 15, 16 people on this, on this Zoom, right? I don't know how many is on YouTube, right, or watching this. But 16, we have to have thousands. We need to have thousands. So we got to do outreach. We have to broaden our outreach, right? We have to be very creative in the method in which we do broaden our outreach, right? In terms of how we're messaging our struggle. In, in terms of our continue to preach to the choir, the choir got to go out there and sing to the people, right? The choir got to get out. Right? And do the kind of work that needs to be done. Door knocking, petitioning, right? People getting people signed up. That's the kind of what we need to do on the ground. Okay. And build your foundation for community development, what I call decolonization program. We need to build decolonization programs across this country, right? That's part of the process. And political prisoners have to be eminently involved. When these building these decolonization programs. There's not a colonization program that does not support political prisoners. Cannot be. Has to be integrally linked together. And by doing so, by building these colonization programs, we are actually engaging the people and raising their consciousness, providing resources, right? Empowering them. That is the goal. To empower our people. We say power to the people. They don't come out of out of thin air. They don't come out of vacuum. Gotta make that happen. Organize. Organize, organize. I put in the chat an uh, organization that we are building called Peace, right? Peace the Coalition, right? Prisons, elderly abuse concerns everyone, right? Why? Because we have our comrades dying in prison. And much of that results is because of medical neglect. Medical neglect. And you know what? It's deliberate. Why? Because it's, system it's systemic. White supremacy. Right? What do white supremacy do? The foundation of white supremacy? Dehumanize, degrade, and devalue black people, brown people, and indigenous people. Right? So that's our goal and objective. We got to reorganize. Now, I'm going to make one other point that Jihad made mentioned, but I want to make sure that we truly understand what's, what ha happened on October 25th, 2021. The United States got found guilty of genocide. Engaging in genocide against black, brown, and this people by an esteemed body of international jurors. There's a whiteout on it. I see black. There's a whiteout on it. No one's talking about it. Genocide, first time in history. First time it was actually raised was 70 years ago, 72 years ago, by the great Paul Robeson, W.D. Du Bois, and William Patterson. Right? 1951, December 17, 1951. Right? The first they raised it, they didn't get no traction, they didn't get no movement. FBI prevented them from actually having the, having the bill or having the, the petition that they submitted to the United Nations actually qualified. Right? But we successfully did that. We got it done. Right? And they got found guilty of genocide. We need to put that out there across the country. And in so doing, tell our people we can live in a system that's engaged in genocide against us. So therefore, what we got to do? We got to create a new means of governing. That's what the people send us about, right? We have to figure out new means of governing. We can't govern ourselves in a system that's engaged in the process of genocide, right? We can't assimilate in that. We got to integrate in that. We have to separate from that. We have to save ourselves. That's the process we're doing. Organize, organize, organize to save ourselves. This is what revolution is about, all right? So we're going to evolve our struggle, right, evolve our struggle by means of putting the R on evolution, right? It's a social dynamic process from which we move our, our society from one level of development to a higher level of development. It's evolutionary. 
right? And the process we do it is revolution. So we must teach the people this process. Organize, organize, organize. All right? And our capacity to do so, our goals and the to do so, as we have been organizing for the last several years, Jericho been existing for the last 22 years in support of political prisons, the first prominent, prominent national organization speaking on behalf of political prisons was Jericho Movement. Right? Now we got organizations jumping all over the place. Very good. Love it. Love it. Now we got to connect them together. Right? And we're going to connect them together under the People's Senate. That's our goal and that's our objective. Right? And so for us, for us, right, uh, we want to free Mumia. We're going to free Leonard. We're going to free Lorenzo. We're going to free Ed. We're going to free Mutulu. We're going to free all. What's it called? Free them all. That's what we got to do. And the only way we can do that, we got to engage our people and have them involved in this process. We have to get organized, right? We have to get the choir, the choir, the choir to speak to the people, to sing to the people, right? And if we do so, if we do so, we broaden our base, right? And then we will have to be asking, as you have made mention, we'll be demanding. And we have the power of the people behind us. That's right. All right? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Walaikum salam. Thank you very much, so much. Thank you to Baba Jalil Mutakim and uh, Baba Jahad Abdul Mumit. Just, you know, their words really provided us with all that we needed, you know, and that spirit, we're getting ready to close up shop, but we're not done yet. Um, we couldn't close without giving you, again, some more spiritual vibes, some more musical vibes, just to really give us really that vibe out of Philadelphia. Shout out to our brother, organizer, activist, and comrade, uh, dear beloved brother, Mike Africa Jr., uh, with his song that he dedicated to his mom once she came home, released last year, actually on Mother's Day. It's so beautiful to see Mike and Debbie home, being able to really just hang out, chill, walk around, and just be with Mike Jr. and his children. So please, y'all, give it up, y'all, for this video and song, Fly Baby, because we can all fly as we get free.
My baby walking on my mama crying And she asked her what was with the tears She said the whole world passed her by Cause she done been away for 40 years My baby gave my mama good advice She said I know a lot you've given up But you done got yourself a second chance And now it's time for you to live it up Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We can fly, people can, our people can fly and we can win. That was so beautiful to see. Um, what can I say about tonight, Abe? Um, we thank you all so, so much for being here with us tonight. On behalf of the Free Moomia Movement, the Love Not Fear campaign, this has been a blessing to be in space with every one of you. We came together with this program in a short time. And the weekend events are still continuing. So please continue to check those out and to join something however you can. Tonight was everything and more, right? We just have been mentored by two great mentors that has continued to fight and are continuing to stand. And so they gave us our, you know, so to speak, marching orders. So let's continue into the new year. Let's show up next week, Friday for Mumia's court date because we will win. And let's continue to just throw each, show each other love and, and, and just continue to stand together in this moment because it's clear that the system is running scared and we are winning and we're not only winning, but we're doing that with, with love. So as we say, love, not fear, let's um, continue to do this work. And Gabe, I can go on rambling because I'm still, I'm still thrilled by uh, Brother Jihad and Jalil and now this video. So listen, you have to take this over. So. Yeah, just, well, just free them all, free them all, free them all. Yes. What's the call? Free them all. Free What's the call? Free them all. What's the call? Free them all. Free them all. That's right. So free continue to organize, continue to do the work and support these campaigns, family. That's it, family. Thank you again for checking in with Thank us. You. We'll see you next week, Friday, 8.30 a.m. at 1301 Filbert Street here in Philadelphia, right in the heart of it at the Center for Criminal Justice. Meet us there, 8.30 a.m. We'll be there, hopefully with a good word from the judge. But again, as I said earlier, even if we get word that is not to our favor, we're going to continue to mobilize and strategize till we bring our folks home. So thank you, everybody. Peace and power. Black power. All so power to the people. Bring them home. Bring them home. Bring them home. All power to the people. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you to our tech team. Thank you so much. Thanks all right. to all the organizers we're good. We're good. and all yeah. the campaigns. Okay. Love Not Fear and Mobilization for Mumia and all the campaigns to bring our folks home, y'all. Thank you so much. Great hosting. Thank you, Sophie. All right, so we're we're not uh, recording.